Hi, everybody. It's nice to be back. Nice to have you again today. Uh, we are going to talk about the Four Noble Truths today and also do some meditation. So before we begin, I just want to let you know who I am and why I'm here. So uh, my name is Ani Pomo Rubiki, and I am the uh, Buddhist nun and the director of Songsang Gampo Buddhist Center of Cleveland. And uh, normally we do everything at our center, but uh, because of the pandemic, we're doing everything online now. So um, every first three Sundays of the month, I'm here on YouTube, uh, live streaming a little Dharma talk and some guided meditation. And um, during the week, we have classes, we have special events like retreats, seminars, and things, movie nights, and things like that. So if you want to learn more, our website is below in the description. Um, sign up for the newsletter, you know, then you'll be up to date on everything. <coughs> Excuse me. So before we begin, um, we want to start with what's called bodhicitta motivation. And I need to pour myself a cup. Here we go. Hold on. Okay. So bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word. It means awakened mind heart. And what it, the definition of it is the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So this whole path is really about um, working for others. So of course, we're developing our, ourselves, we're working with our mind and things like that, but the purpose is so that we can uh, bring all beings to enlightenment and free them from suffering. So where you are, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're not Buddhist, um, at least can we think the time we spent together this morning um, benefits others, uh, including ourselves, but not only ourselves, okay? And then we just take a moment to consider our teachers. We're extremely fortunate to have uh, Jigme Kinsa Rinpoche, Tuku Pema Wangyal Rinpoche, and Taku Mata Rinpoche as our spiritual guides. So um, we rely on them for their wisdom and compassion. And uh, without them, I can't say impossible, but it would be extremely difficult to uh, move forward with this path. So I just want to, whoops, I want to make sure here that um, my microphone is picking up, sorry. All right. Well, I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, put it in the chat that you can't hear me, which doesn't make sense because anyway, I'll continue. So um, as I said, we're going to be discussing the Four Noble Truths. So Four Noble Truths is the first teaching given by the Buddha. And they are, you might have heard of them, uh, the truth of suffering, and I'm going to, before I continue, I want to ap approach this word suffering, okay? Uh, the the original language is, the word is dukkha, all right? So when we say suffering, we automatically think um, something quite severe, right? We're suffering from heartache, or we're suffering from grief, or we're suffering from COVID, you know, these kind of big, big things, okay? But dukkha... Uh, actually covers the whole range of unpleasantness, unsatisfactoriness, okay? So that can be something really small, like, um, you know, having a backache up to, you know, the most intense suffering you can imagine, okay? So everything in between. But more than that, it includes, you know, mental suffering, emotional suffering, and more subtly, it includes this... Um, this te habitual tendency that we have to constantly look for happiness outside of ourselves, rely on outside things to make us happy, right? And to always think happiness is just around the corner, right? We have this habit of thinking, oh, as soon as I 
X, Y, Z, then I'll be happy. Like, you know, as soon as winter is over, then I'll be happy. As soon as the pandemic is over, then I'll be happy. As soon as I get a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a new house, a new job, the list is endless. Then I will be happy. Okay. okay. And when we say happy in that context as ordinary beings, we're actually talking about lasting happiness. We expect these things subconsciously and unaware, or maybe we're aware. We expect these things to bring us lasting happiness. They cannot. It's impossible. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to broaden for you the context of the word suffering in the context of the Four Noble Truths, okay? So the first one is the truth of suffering or dukkha or unsatisfactoriness. The second is the cause, okay? The third is the cessation and the fourth is the path, all right? So now I'm gonna um, explain each of those in turn. <coughs> Excuse me. So truth of suffering or truth of unsatisfactoriness. So that refers to what I was just saying, that the Buddha is asking us, please notice this, all right? Please be aware of this. Now, if we use the word suffering, we automatically say, well, of course I'm aware of that. I know when I'm sick. I know it's unpleasant. But if we use the word unsatisfactoriness, we're not always aware of that, right? We're not aware that there is suffering involved in almost every act that we do, okay? Like, for example, I needed to take a, a sip of this tea. Why? Because my, my throat is scratchy. So I take the sip of the tea to relieve the suffering in my throat. We lie down to and go to sleep to relieve the suffering of being tired. We eat because of hunger. We drink because of thirst. On and on and on. And we don't notice that. And we especially don't notice this um, constant um, search for lasting happiness that is never fulfilled. All right? Temporary happiness, definitely fulfilled. Definitely you know, um, a love affair can bring us temporary happiness, a new car can bring us temporary happiness, a new job, whatever. All Lots of things from the outside can bring us temporary happiness. If they brought us lasting happiness, we would never need to try again, you know, that if we thought, oh, as soon as I get my, my new car, I'll be happy, then we wouldn't need ever to do anything else to be happy. If we thought, um, you know, I don't know, if we thought this relationship would make us happy, we would be happy throughout the relationship. We would never have to not have another relationship. We would never have to try to do anything else to be happy. Now we can see that that's not true, right? We can see that very clearly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, the Buddha is asking, please look at that. Please notice that. All right. And why? Why do we have to notice that? Why can't we just be blissfully ignorant to go through life thinking, oh, we're just happy all the time? Because we have to see what the problem is if we're going to work on that. Right. We have to see where the issue is if we're going to apply the right medicine to it. Okay, so that's why. Let's look at it. So there are three types of suffering in this first note. We're still on the first noble truth, okay? We're talking about three types of suffering. That's my dog, excuse me. I meant to tie him up and I forgot. Can you pull me down, please? So um, the first type is the suffering. It's called the suffering of suffering. And that is precisely what we think when we use the term suffering, okay? So suffering of suffering is like being sick, grieving, you know, breaking your leg, all those kind of things, whatever we call suffering normally, okay? Then there's the suffering of change. And this one is really 
the most useful uh, in a way on the path. And um, it really outlines the problem, I think, a little more clearly, right? So the suffering of change has to do with impermanence, all right? And impermanence itself is, is the contemplation of that. The Buddha called the contemplation of impermanence the king of all practices, all right? And the reason for that is because it really helps us in a myriad of ways. One of the ways is to actually reduce our suffering. When we realize that everything is impermanent, we're not clinging onto it so strongly, okay? And then when we inevitably lose that or when that changes, okay, the suffering of change, we're less heartbroken because we're not surprised because we understand that everything's impermanent, okay? So suffering of change is the first subset to the second, um, uh, actually to the first noble truth, sorry. So there's... Um, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and under the suffering of change, there's two topics, okay? The first is um, everything that we find pleasant and enjoyable eventually goes away because of impermanence. So like I keep talking about relationships, right? So our relationships eventually will disappear. Even if we have the most beautiful, wonderful, perfect relationship, eventually that will end. Okay. Um, either, you know, I die or that person dies. Most often, they, people don't die at the same time, right? So that causes a lot of pain, of course. Um, you know, maybe we have a milkshake that we really like, okay? Uh, eventually, it's gone, you know, right? It's in our stomach, and then it comes out the other end. Right? Uh, and we can literally apply that to everything. Anything that we look at, anything that we find pleasant will eventually disappear. All right? We're sitting watching a beautiful sunset. It finishes at some point, right? Excuse me. So the other one is very interesting and it really is something that is not hard to understand, but we typically never notice it, all right? And that is that <clears throat> any pleasurable thing that we do, if we do it long enough, turns into suffering. So it's so strange that we never notice that, but it really is that way, okay? Let's say that you really enjoy playing video games, all right? And like, when you get home from school, to play your favorite video game, whatever it is, and you start playing and you're really into it, right? And you don't want to do your homework and you don't want to do anything else and you don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to do this and maybe talk to the other people playing the game if you're playing with others. Okay? At some point, that turns into suffering. At some point, you get too tired. At some point, your eyes start to burn. At some point, you get sloppy because you're too tired and then you start losing and then you don't like the game anymore and then you decide oh i, I have to i have to stop now i gotta go to bed <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> okay so that turns into suffering or let's say you're eating even your most favorite meal or snack or dessert you're eating that pumpkin pie yeah at some point if you keep eating makes a stomachache, it, it causes suffering, right? So we don't notice that. And why is the Buddha saying, hey, you have to look at that? Not so that we don't enjoy anything, right? Not so that, oh, you should never have a piece of pumpkin pie or play a video game, you know? He's saying, we have to look that we look, we have to understand that we're looking for happiness in the wrong place. Okay. And this constant running search after lasting happiness in, from the outside world is never going to bring us satisfaction. So because we don't see that typically, 
then the Buddha is pointing that out to us and saying, here is the suffering. Okay, please see that fully. All right. So the second noble truth is the cause, the cause of suffering. And that kind of, um, you know, sort of transitions very well from the truth of suffering in this sort of craving, right? In this um, constant running after and grasping at what we think will bring us happiness, right? So um, that's from the Theravada point of view. So there's various schools in Buddhism. The foundational school is the Theravada school. And um, in Tibetan Buddhism, which is what we practice, um, is the Vajrayana. So according to the Theravada, it's this um, craving, right, after material things. And material things um, means really anything outside of ourselves, not just a new computer, a new video game, you know, it means also a new partner, a different job, uh, a new house, better relationship, you know, even things like that are considered um, being materialistic, okay. Uh, but on the Vajrayana point of view, the cause of ignorance, of, uh, sorry, the cause of suffering is uh, what's called um, fundamental ignorance or ma rigpa. So fundamental ignorance means ignorance about the nature of reality, how the world and the mind actually work, okay? So what that fundamental, pardon me, ignorance leads to is us doing unvirtuous or negative, or I really prefer the word unskillful uh, acts of body, speech, and mind which result in suffering for ourselves, okay? So otherwise known as karma. I hesitate to use the word karma actually because um, it's been so sort of misunderstood and, um, you know, in the, it, it's, it has this popular uh, meaning which is really incorrect of uh, revenge, right? You see it online all the time on social media. Oh, karma's gonna get him. Oh, karma got him. Oh, karma's a bitch, you know. But we have to, there's two, you know, sides to karma, okay? There's positive karma and there's negative karma, right? So positive acts of body, speech, and mind result in happiness. Negative acts of body, speech, and mind result in suffering. What goes up must come down, all right? So, um, why I prefer to use the word skillful rather than uh, virtuous or unskillful rather than unvirtuous is because actually, um, I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but actually there is no moral judgment on those things. Karma is not seen as um, a moral judgment, actually. it It's seen as like a natural law, like... You could say like gravity, like I said earlier, what goes up must come down. There's no moral judgment to gravity. Yeah, It just understood this is a natural law. So karma is a more complicated subject, so we don't have time to go into that very deeply, but um, that is the, the, the point, okay? So because of our fundamental ignorance about how things actually work, and this kind of veils of delusion that we have because of that, then we do negative acts actually in search of happiness, okay? But they bring us suffering. So that is the cause of suffering from the Vajrayana point of view, okay? <clears throat> so the um, third noble truth is there's the cessation of suffering. And this is very positive. It, it just essentially means that it's possible to stop suffering, okay? That's about it for that third noble truth. It's quite simple. The fourth noble truth is the path that leads to the cessation of suffering, all right? So from the Theravada point of view, 
uh, the path really consists of mindfulness meditation, um, of course, paying attention to our uh, skillful acts of body, speech, and mind, our unskillful acts of body, speech, and mind, and uh, renunciation in the um, common understanding, let's say, of renunciation, meaning we live, try to live a very simple life, um, we don't try to get a lot of things, this kind of thing. In the Theravada school, um, it really is about, um, it really, the way that it's taught, it's kind of like only um, if you are an ascetic monastic can you really reach the goal of nirvana from that school's point of view. From the Vajrayana point of view, the path is um, in its most um, essentialized form, let's say. The path is about um, studying the teachings or learning the teachings or hearing uh, the teachings and then contemplation and then meditation. So hearing or studying the teachings can be, you know, something like this, um, you know, listening from a Lama uh, um, or reading a book or watching a video or whatever, some way to hear the teachings, okay, or have access to them, get them in the head, okay, whether it's reading or what have you, okay. Then contemplation. So this is quite interesting because it brings in this very important idea from the Buddhist point of view that we need to think for ourselves that the path is not about just blindly following what the Buddha said. We should examine them for ourselves see for ourselves whether they are true or untrue, all right? So, for example, when I first uh, got into Buddhism many years ago, uh, I, I, they had that teaching, everything is impermanent. Every, everything is impermanent. And I honestly did not believe it. I said, no, I'm sure that's not true. I'm going to find something that is permanent. And I really tried you know, to find something that's that's permanent. And I couldn't find anything that is permanent. So that really helped me versus just saying, oh, Buddha said, or this monk said, or that Rinpoche said, everything's impermanent, so everything must be impermanent. It's not a deep understanding, you know? It's just a very surface understanding and a kind of blind faith that the Buddha himself taught against, okay? The Buddha said, that you should examine the teachings like you examine gold. Okay, so we don't, most of us, I don't know who's out there. Maybe some of you buy gold all the time. Typically we do not, okay? So let's look at this another way that would be easier for understand to understand. Examining the teachings is like examining a used car that you're gonna buy. If you're smart, you don't just buy a used car without checking it out, right? That's a good way to buy a lemon that will end up costing you a lot more money than what you paid for the car because you have to do all these repairs, right? So if you're smart and you're buying a used car, then you're going to take it to the mechanic. You're gonna look at it very carefully. You're gonna look underneath it to see how the, if there's rust under there, you're gonna see that the engine works and so forth and so on, right? It's the same. If anybody, and the Buddha taught this also, there's a sutra called the Kalama Sutra, K-A-L-A-M-A, -A -A, just like it sounds, Kalama, which you can read online, just search for it. Um, so this sutra is about this village called Kalama at the time of the Buddha, where um, all these, you know, various um, preachers, so I don't know what the right word is, were coming through the town and saying, um, you know, hey, our my path is the best path. It's no better, better way than, you know, we have the one true faith. Yeah? And then someone else would come through with a totally different um, path and say, no, that person's wrong. We have the one true faith, okay? And that kept happening until the poor 
people of this village, their heads were just spinning, you know, I don't, which of these is true? So they approached the Buddha and they outlined their problem. And the Buddha said, look, don't believe. And the whole sutra is about not believing. And he said, like, including me and what I say, you know, don't believe just because it's tradition. Don't believe just because your parents practice that or, uh, or because someone in robes told you that, or because there's a book that says that, you know, and on and on he gives this list. Believe when you yourself have tested the teachings, have examined the teachings, and see that they are praised by the wise, meaning they're wise, okay? Not stupid, not shallow, okay? And, and, and test them out for yourself to see if they're true. And if you see that it meets this criteria, then accept it. And if you don't, then don't, all right? So um, we need to, this examination is part of the path from the Buddhist point of view, all right? So that's the contemplation aspect. <clears throat> so let's say like today, okay, I talked about the first noble truth that there is suffering and there's these different kinds. Oh, I forgot to tell you the third kind. No, there's actually three types of suffering. There's suffering of suffering. There's the suffering of change. Okay, that's the one where everything pleasant eventually um, goes away and anything pleasant, if we do long enough, um, eventually turns into suffering. The uh, and the third one is all pervasive suffering. So what that one refers to is like, just by virtue of having a body, for example, um, we're going to experience pain. And just to live from one day to the next, we have to do, be involved in some negative acts like killing. Okay. And I don't mean like, you know, killing your neighbor or something. Okay. I just mean just to eat. All right. Even if you are vegan, which our teachers highly you know, really encourage us to do that because of all the killing involved in that. But let's say that you're eating celery today for lunch. Well, there were a lot of lives, you know, lost because of that. To plow the ground, you know, you're killing a lot of insects, you know, frogs, all kinds of beings that live in that ground, right? To uh, plant the celery and then to harvest the celery, it's the same. A lot of animals killed in that process. That's why sometimes if you live in the country or you're driving through the country and you see, um, you know, I don't know what you call it, plowing machine. <laughs> Obviously I don't live on a farm, but anyway, and it will be followed by birds, crows or whatever will be following behind it. Why? Because they're digging up the worms and insects that uh, live in the soil, okay? Then even to transport it, on trucks or planes or ships or whatever involves killing a lot of insects. So just to have celery, we are involved in killing. So that's creating some negative karma for us. So that's why it's called all pervasive suffering. There's just nothing we can do about some things, okay? Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, stop eating animals and animal products because that just exponentially increases the suffering um, involved and the killing involved because those animals also have to eat crops, right? And then there's lots of killing of the bugs that live on them. And then of course, killing them, which is incredible suffering anyway. So, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> excuse me. So back to the fourth noble truth, which is um, the path, right? So the first is learning. The second is um, contemplation. So let's say that, you know, I just talked about this first noble truth, the second one, suffering change, right? So you can say, well, okay, that's what she said, and she's educated in Buddhism, so it must be true. No, don't believe me, please. See for yourself. Observe for yourself. Next time you have a glass of water or go to the bathroom or take a shower, anything, just see for yourself whether that's true or not, okay? So the third 
So ancillary of all these subdivisions. I think next time I talk about this, I might put a document underneath um, that just has an outline of it. So the fourth noble truth, right, is the path. Um, from the Vajrayana point of view, that's divided into three, study, contemplation, and then meditation, all right? So the meditation aspect is about taking these things that we've learned through study and contemplation and internalizing that, making that, um, you know, part of who we are, really digesting it. And so we can keep something in our head, but if we don't like absorb it, it just remains in the head. We don't really know what it is, all right? So um, for example, like I grew up in a funeral home, okay? So I saw grief all around me all the time growing up, my whole life growing up. But, and I could see that, okay, it's painful, clearly. I mean, people are crying. They look very sad. Um, you know, grief is, is one of the worst kind of sufferings we can have. All of that I understood intellectually. But it wasn't until someone I loved died that I really understood what grief was. I had that visceral experience of grief. Okay. So um, meditation is very, very important part of the path. Some people get stuck in the intellectualization because it's very interesting. It's also, um, if you like that kind of thing, if you like philosophy, for example, it's just, you're like a kid in a candy store. There's no end to it. It's so interesting and subtle and so very rigorous philosophy. But if you just stay on that level and never practice, there's not much point, you know? You might as well be studying snails or something like it. It really doesn't make much difference. Okay, so we need to do the meditation also and try to bring the philosophy into our life even when we're not meditating in order to progress on the path, okay? So, um, yeah, so I won't say much more about that. Okay, so now we're going to actually do some meditation, which is so important, okay? So the um, first meditation taught by the Buddha is mindfulness of breathing, okay? So in this meditation, essentially what we're doing is taking the posture of meditation, which I'll explain in a second, and paying attention to the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the nose, Okay, so like just this area of the nose. So we notice that sense. I hope you can hear my dog snoring. Um, mm, okay. Wake up. Okay. So um, yeah, so we're paying attention to the sensation of the breath and we're letting the thoughts just come and go. So a thought will arise dwell and disappear, and then it would be replaced by another one that arises, dwells, and disappears, okay? So what we're trying to do in this meditation is maintain awareness of the breath and just let those thoughts come and go without engaging in them, all right? So uh, we might have a thought like, um, you know, it's snowy today. What we want to do is just Notice that, come back to the breath. Well, we might want to label that thinking and come back to the breath. Okay? That's the ideal that we're trying to reach, okay? What we want to avoid is running after that thought. So let's say we're trying to meditate. Uh, we have the thought, um, uh, you know, whatever. It's snowing today, and then we just run with it. Oh, it's snowing today. It wasn't snowing yesterday. Oh my God, when is winter going to be over? Oh, winter combined with this pandemic is driving me crazy. Oh, I wonder how that person is who was coughing and seemed like they had. Right? We just run and run and run and run and run after that. Okay. This is going to happen. Okay. So if that happens, which I expect it will for all of us. Um, as soon as you realize, oh, I got totally distracted, just bring the mind back to the breath. That's it. Without judgment, all right? Without judging the, 
the thoughts that we have, good or bad, and without judging ourselves for that momentary distraction. When we notice we're distracted, that's exactly the thing we're trying to develop, noticing when we're distracted and bringing the mind back. So that is something really positive. That is a victory, not a failing. Okay? All right. So let's begin this meditation. So um, the posture is, if you're sitting on the floor, just cross your legs in whatever way is comfortable for you, okay? If you're sitting in a chair, just put your feet flat on the floor, all right? Otherwise, the instructions are exactly the same, okay? So your hand should be either like palms down on your knees, palms up in your lap like that, okay? Or with your fingers on top of each other and your thumbs touching like that. I don't know if I look like I'm making a heart, but I'm not, okay? <laughs> this thumb is weird, all right? And then your arms should be relaxed. So you're not holding them in, you're not holding them out, just relaxed, okay? Your back should be straight. This is very important, the most important point in meditation as far as the body is concerned, is that your back is straight, okay? Not too much like that, like you're in the army or something, like just straight. And your shoulders should be a little bit back. So the way that I do that, get into that position is very simple. Just roll your shoulders back one time and you'll see right away that it opens up your chest, okay? So because your spine is straight, back of your neck should also be straight. So you're just gonna, just tuck in your chin a little bit, not like this, okay? But what we have a tendency sometimes is to do like that, even slightly, oh, we wanna avoid that, so. Mouth is closed but relaxed, tongue resting on the roof of the mouth, breathing through the nose, right? The eyes ideally should be open, but half open. So if you look straight ahead and you just lower your eyes about halfway, that's a good position for your eyes. Just let them unfocused gaze like that. Okay. If that's really uncomfortable for you, which it is for some people, just close your eyes. It's okay. All right. So I'm going to ring the gong to start. Whoa. And also to um, finish this meditation, okay. All right, so here we go. So gently be aware of the breath coming in and out of the nose. Try to keep your awareness there, but not in a tight way, in a really relaxed and spacious way. So you're aware of your environment as well, but you're mainly focusing on the breath. And you're not trying to stop the thoughts, okay? 
Just let them come and go like clouds in the sky. Bring your mind back to the breath. Relaxed awareness. Now you can begin to count the breaths, counting either every in-breath or every out-breath up to a total of 10 breaths. So we count because it helps us to realize more quickly if we've gotten distracted because we'll notice, oh, I totally lost count, okay? So um, let's say you get to four and then you get distracted. As Soon as you realize that, Simply bring the mind back, start again at one. If you get to 10, come back, start again at one. If you go beyond 10, it's another form of distraction. So as soon as you realize you're at 15 or what have you, simply bring the mind back and start again at one. So please start that now.
Okay. So now we're going to do uh, an analytical meditation on impermanence. Okay. So it's more of a con contemplation of impermanence. Um, so maintain the posture. Okay. But this one, if you want to close your eyes, it's totally fine. So just relax in your body and relax in your mind. So the first thing we're gonna do is to look at the body, look at your body, and really try to be aware of each part of your body, your head, face, shoulders, arms, upper back, lower back, chest, abdomen, right leg, left leg, right foot, left foot. Now consider all the different organs that you have in your body eyes, ears, throat, lungs, stomach, colon, reproductive organs. And notice your blood, veins, bones, bone marrow. And think about all of these things and how they are made up of molecules and atoms whizzing around. How your body is changing and moving moment to moment. You're breathing in and out, your lungs expanding and contracting, your heart beating, the blood circulating throughout your body the synapses in your brain and take a moment to consider the constant motion going on inside your body. And then again, each part of your body is made up of molecules and atoms, subatomic particles. Now consider the room that you're in, the chair or cushion you're sitting on, the floor, the walls, the ceiling. Every aspect is also impermanent decaying every second and made up of molecules and atoms whizzing around. Now consider the outside world as a whole, all the people and animals also made of various parts going deeper and deeper to molecules and atoms and subatomic particles. And the same for all the inanimate objects, the buildings, cars, roads, the trees and mountains and rivers and oceans, all changing millisecond by millisecond, all made of molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles. Now move outside the world and consider, I mean the earth, right? And consider 
the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe itself is also changing every millisecond, moving towards extinction and ultimate change. So if our entire experience is like this, changing from the smallest to the largest, from the largest to the smallest, how are we going to hold on to anything? How are we going to grasp at anything expecting it to last forever? Even our negative experiences are subject to change and can become better. So we don't need to worry. And we don't need to cling and grasp. The more we are aware of impermanence on every level, the more relaxed and free we become. So I encourage you to bring this awareness as constantly as you can, as consistently as you can in your day-to-day -day life. When you look outside and you see snow, consider that tomorrow it might not be there, that a few months ago it wasn't there, that winter turns into spring, that eventually the snow melts. When you see the day getting darker, Consider the impermanence of the day, that time marches on, as they say, without us being able to stop it. When you're brushing your teeth before bed, consider that when you brushed your teeth this morning, you're not the same person anymore. You're however many hours older, your teeth have collected various bacteria and gunk throughout the day. Yeah, you're actually brushing, you know, bone that will eventually be seen as part of your skeleton when you die. The toothpaste in your tube, the tube of toothpaste is getting emptier and emptier each time you brush your teeth. Your toothbrush is also getting worn out so many things to consider just in that one action of brushing your teeth, eating, drinking, everything. This contemplation on a regular basis will really reduce suffering that comes from expecting things to be permanent. All right. <clears throat> So now we're going to say the um, closing prayers. Uh, there is a link in the descrip description for that. Um, if you don't want to join us, there's no problem at all in not joining us. If you do, um, please read along. So this first one, um, Parnashavadi is an emanation of the female Buddha Tara. And Parnashavadi's particular activity is to help counteract pandemics. So that's why we're saying this these days. So we're going to say it once in English, and we're going to say this mantra three times. Lady, Holy One, enlightened and compassionate, appear now as the leaf-clad goddess, healer of disease. Do not turn away, but in compassion, take myself and all beings of this age of five degenerations, 
Perform your deeds of soothing, purging, and cauterizing all the pains of illness, plagues, and pestilence. Om Pishatsi Pranashavati Sawat Sola Prashamanai Sua. Om Pishatsi Pranashavati Sawat Sola Prashamanai Sua. Om Pishatsi Pranashavati Sola Prashamanai Sua. And then the next four are long life prayers. So this is you know, kind of making the wish that the teachers live a long time so they can continue to teach as we progress on the path. So these we're just going to say in Tibetan, <clears throat> beginning with the long life uh, for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Kanri wawe kowe shinkam su pedante wa malu juwene chenre si wan ten zingam su ye and before we continue, I did want to say one thing. After we're done here, there's going to be some time if you have a question. So um, if you have a question, you can um, put it in the chat, and then I'll do my best to answer it. Okay? So, Jigme Kinsir Rinpoche. Om Swasri Jigme Dab Jam Se Chin Lab Ki Kinsay Du Kadun Zin Du Den Chok. Samsumishi doje ta ten chin, ten dam and patron eta shin show. Om swasti se like and search in la tin jun lay, nun sing taxi, you chu pema wo. Samsum no drake yago ta ten lay, lap chen ten de shi ten ta ke show. Lama kung kam sum po so adep chutu could say ring wa so adep. Chine tashin ge pa so adep lama dandre wa me pa chin ki do. So the next prayer we're going to say once in English and once in Tibetan and at the final three we'll say just in English and then we'll say that hundred syllable mantra at the end. So this first one is called Dedicating the Merit. Okay, it's for Dedicating the Merit. So merit is essentially good karma, positive energy, whatever you want to call it, that we develop through studying and practicing the Dharma. We dedicate it to all sentient beings. So what that means is we're redirecting the energy. If we don't dedicate, it just comes back to us as individually as some kind of good fortune or happiness, which is great. But if we do dedicate, it's better because then we are, you know, sending that energy out to benefit all sentient beings. It doesn't mean it won't also benefit us, but we want to include everyone else in that benefit as well. So that's merit. Then it says, by this merit, we all attain omniscience. So omniscience here is a synonym for full enlightenment. May you defeat the enemy wrongdoing. Goes back to what I was saying earlier about negative karma. You know, it's our own negative acts of body, speech, and mind that result in suffering. So that's like the real enemy, if you want to use that word. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. So that's considered the four main streams of suffering for human beings. Um, and then from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So ocean of cyclic existence. So cyclic existence is this round of birth and death and birth and death that we've been going through since beginning this time in all different forms. It's called an ocean because it's vast and deep. And may I free all beings. So that's, again, the bodhicitta motivation. Okay, so once in English, once in Tibetan. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of psychic existence, may I free all beings. So nam di tam che se pane, to me ne pe dra nam pam che shing, ke kana chi valon tru paye, si pe tsole toa toa sho. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may it too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. Ever absorbed in the display of divine forms and primordial awareness, appearance, sound, and perception in the state of divinities, mantras, and dharmakaya, 
May I, inseparable from the practice of profound and secret great yoga, attain within the essence of mind the state of one taste. You know the mantra? Om Bhadra Sattva Samaya Manupalaya Bhadra Sattva Tenopa Tishta Dritta Ome Bhava Sutoka Ome Bhava Suboka Ome Bhava Anurat Ome Bhava Sawa Siri Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutsa Me Chitam Shriyam Kuruhu Ha 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 ho bhagavan sawatata gata vadrama me munsa vadri bhava maha samaya sarva ah. Okay, so that's it for the prayers. I don't see any questions. So we will end here, but before we go, I just wanna make a couple announcements, um, especially if you came later. So in the description, you will see our website um, and some other links as well, as well as a link to make a donation. Um, if you can do that, we would be extremely grateful, um, even though we're not at our physical center anymore for the moment, um, we still have to pay rent, utilities, and so forth. And we have other expenses like salary and things like that. So your donations are how we um, pay those bills. So if you can, we would very much appreciate it. Okay. Then um, please sign up for the newsletter if you want to know what's going on. Now we're doing everything online. Classes, retreats, seminars, um, this meditation, most Sundays, um, movie nights on the last Friday of the month, and so forth. So we will be starting some new classes in the spring. Um, they'll be, I think, next week, probably. I don't know. I have to look at the calendar. Yeah, it should be next Friday. We'll have a movie um, that we watch together online and stuff like that. So sign up for the newsletter so we can um, keep in touch. Okay? All right. So thank you so, so much for joining me this morning. I'm very happy to be back. And um, I'll see you next week or before then. All right. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.